Thank you guys for coming in this morning. It's been a rough week for me. Uh, several of you guys have called, maybe not to send their well wishes to me, but uh, some of you know, I see a lot of blue out here right now that my beloved Cardinals were knocked out. <laughs> so I, I was trying to find my Nationals uniform, my Nationals jersey. I've been a lifelong Nationals fan. No, I'm kidding. Um, what, what I decided to bring today, um, after watching the kids come out, I'm like, I don't know, how, how, how are you supposed to follow that? Well, you follow that with the Word of God. So no matter what we're doing here, that's what we preach is the Word of God. So I'm going to cover an entire book of the Bible. So if you'll turn to the very last chapter, the very last book of Revelation, and then go back one book to Jude. So that's what we're going to cover this morning. We're going to cover the book of Jude. Um, Jude was a brother or a stepbrother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that in the text necessarily, but he does say that he is the brother of James. And we know that James, that he's referring to, is the same James that wrote the book of James in the Bible. Um, during the initial, I guess, the initial um, teaching of Jesus Christ, Jude didn't believe. And he tells us this in John, in John 7, 5, for even his own brothers did not believe. I think this is important to think about whenever you think of when the text was written, which this text was written in um, AD 60s, 65. So it was whenever, uh, after Jesus Christ was crucified, after his resurrection. But these are people that still were in the same time frame that actually saw our Lord and Savior in person. Uh, it was written originally for the Jewish um, Christians, so those that were of the Jewish faith prior, because you'll see references to uh, the book of Enoch and another book of Moses that's not in the uh, Holy Bible. But we start off here in verse 1, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God and the Father and kept for a Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love, be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted in God's holy people. So right there he's already telling us that, you know, I would like to get, come up here and give you a warm and fuzzy story uh, about Jesus' love and how you're always forgiven, you're always saved, and you are. But there's things you have to do. And that is actual repentance of your sins, actual teaching of the true word of God. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And we... we it's funny to think about this. This was written in early 65. So here, 2017, so uh, roughly 1980 years later, 1950, 60 years later, um, the church saw the same thing then that we're seeing in the church today. This is nothing new. Nothing new. Uh, where you have false teachers coming out telling you what you want to hear to tickle your ears. Um, Jude was seeing it right there. This was a brother of Christ. And you also notice he didn't say that he was a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's not what mattered. What mattered was that he was a servant of Jesus Christ, just like we're all servants of Christ. <laughs> Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment of the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and the perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Also today, we're being told by certain sects that there is no heaven and hell. We know that's a lie. All you have to do is open up God's word, the Bible, and it tells it right here. If I wrote the Bible, there wouldn't be a heaven and a hell. There would just be a heaven, but I didn't get to write it. 
In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse of celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Even today, if you try to tell somebody about Jesus' love, um, just telling them usually, it, it doesn't work. You have to show it. They have to see it within you. But if you try to beat them with facts from the Word, saying, well, the Bible says so, does it usually work? Does it work talking to non-believers about what the Bible says? Their hearts have been hardened, and only our love can help soften that heart. Only the prayer to God can soften that heart. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's heirs. And they have been destroyed by Korah's rebellion. So these same people are coming out and telling you this are the false teachers, those that are only gained for profit, for sexual immortality. Not immortality, immorality. Sexual immortality. Um, If you think about we lost Hugh Hefner this past week. Um, there's nothing great about that. Uh, this was a man that pushed perversion for years. Uh, even one that in my younger childhood, it was a childhood, my younger days, uh, you know, fell into that. This is a guy that is in hell right now. There's nobody here or nobody out there that can tell me that he's anywhere but that for the perversion that he pushed throughout his life. These people are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and unrooted, twice dead. There are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch. The seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the definite words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Like I said, I'd love to stand up here and just flatter everybody and give them a good pat on the back, but um, that's condemning you. Um, you know, what, what I want is for everybody here to open up this Bible, read it daily, not take necessarily what I say as gospel. Don't do that, that's stupid. <laughs> but take what God's word is as gospel. Enoch um, an interesting thing about Enoch, Enoch in the Bible earlier mentioned was um, he walked alongside God and then he was no more. So there's only a mention of uh, a few people in the Bible that did not actually uh, feel natural death. Enoch's one of them. The other one is Elijah who got to ride in the chariot up into heaven. Um, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow more natural instincts and do not have the spirit. Again, the natural instincts, this is never, uh, you know, you think about following your own heart. You got to do what makes you happy. Um, All those lies being told that we do what makes ourselves happy. That's what gets society into trouble. That's what causes the sin in the world. You have to reach out and realize it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. He's the one that we serve. Everything is about God. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves 
in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord, Jesus Christ, to bring you to eternal life. Even though that we're born with that sin in our heart, that's why Jesus Christ came. He knew that we couldn't do this on our own. Don't ever think that you can do this on your own. I mean, that's kind of saying to Christ that we don't need him. We, we need Jesus Christ. And God sent him for us. It's such an amazing, amazing thought or feeling that he loved us enough to send his son. For those out here now that have children, even the thought of causing your child pain for someone else is just an, an unnatural thought. But God, you know, it wasn't that he just died for us. He took on the sin. He took on every impure thought, every impure act that I've ever done. He's done the same thing for each and every one of us. He took on, and not just what I've done right now, but what I'm going to mess up on later. What people have messed up on in the past. Be merciful in those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy, mixed with fear. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. It doesn't mean that we ignore um, those that are in need of help or that we're rude, that we bash them. We still show them love because it's the eternity that matters. Remember we talked about um, the Playboy founder, the 92 years or whatever they spent on earth may be the one that most men dream about. But his eternity in the fire pits of hell is not worth it. So those decisions that you make today or tomorrow isn't worth an eternity in hell. It's kind of a crummy message to give after you see a bunch of kids singing, isn't it? But it's the truth. And that's what we do here. We speak the truth. We speak the Bible. We don't sugarcoat it for you. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. So, as I was trying to come up with or figure out what God wanted me to speak about today, um, it, it was kind of a, a last second, I wouldn't say last second, but trying to come up with what what people uh, need to hear is difficult, and I'm not very good at it um, as far as planning on my own. But studying this and trying to get it together, I was listening to a sermon by uh, Dr. Elmer's Towns, and he had eight points um, to keep in mind when going through the book of Jude. Which, by the way, w whenever you actually look up sermons for the book of Jude, I think I found four. There was four whole sermons on this book. Um, he says the very first thing that we need to do is stay in the Word. So that's what, um, we, we don't need to be reading. Um, a, well, they help, the, these commentaries that tell us what the Bible says. We need to be reading the Bible for ourselves, for what the Bible says. Then number two, this is one of the most important ones, that's to pray. That's that continued conversation with God. Whenever we're not sure what to do, it's time to get on our knees, not the national anthem, time to get on our knees and pray about what to do. Sometimes we're missing that. Sometimes we're missing that conversation with God. And then number three is the fellowship, and he says with God, and that's having that two-way conversation with him, talking to him, just like you're talking to your own heavenly or to your own earthly father, maybe, asking for advice, talking to your best friend down the road, asking for advice, having that same conversation and fellowship with God. But then I want to take that a step further and say have that same type of fellowship with other believers. You gotta have other believers, other friends that you can come to. These, the fellowship with other believers, make sure that it's a pure fellowship. 
Make sure that it's not um, a guy going to another girl for help. That's not, that's not the right way to do it. If someone here needs help, if it's a guy, feel free to come to me. If you're a girl that needs help, I'm going to send you to somebody else. <laughs> I'm not going to put myself in that situation. So I'll probably ask Sarah to give you a, a hand or help or somebody else. But don't get into the conversations with others. Um, you don't want to keep secrets like that. Because even though it may start innocent, it can lead into something a lot worse. Have hope. That was number four. A reason to keep, and I added this myself, to keep on keeping on. We have friends that is awesome to see what God's doing in their lives. So what gives me hope is seeing what other people are able to do in their lives. What gives me hope is seeing what my kids are able to do, the way my kids are able to share and sing up here. What gives me hope is my wife and what she does at work and with her friends. What gives me hope is each and every person here that whenever you leave here today, it's not just about Sunday service. It's about the other things that we're able to do in the community, the other things that's going to help us grow, the other things that are going to help bring others to Jesus Christ. Ministry to others, that's number five. So that is not just being here on that Sunday service. That's those other things that you do to help the church, whether it's hosting the small groups, whether it's taking care of the lawn out here, whether it's um, making uh, breakfast in the mornings here, uh, helping with the um, New Commandment men's ministry, helping with uh, the young adults groups, helping with uh, all the kids groups and functions that we have here. Evangelism, which then leads into evangelism, is number six, and that is proclaiming Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There is only one way, and that's through the Son. We need to proclaim that. Again, if I wrote the Bible, everybody would just be able to say, I'm in and be in. But I didn't. My wonderful father wrote it. And he inspired it. And he tells us through his son, Jesus Christ, that no one gets to the Father except through me. Number seven, the hardest for us is to be separate from sin. We're born with that sinful heart. We're born with that sinful um, need, I guess you could say. But we have to separate ourselves from that. We have to recognize that there's a sin there. We have to recognize that we need to be a part of that sin, not a part of it, a part from it. Saying that it's okay, just a little bit, I'll ask for forgiveness and everything will be good. If you know that's the plan, you've already messed up. Then number eight, he wrote, and this is from Dr. Elmer Towns, is that begins and ends with assurance and salvation. This begins and ends with knowing that Jesus Christ died for us. All that we had to do was ask for his help, for his forgiveness, and then repent from our sins. Repent, stop doing those things that we know we ought not do. And that's all we have to do. It's hard to believe that all we have to do is ask for forgiveness. And there's times that we can't even forgive ourselves for things. But God doesn't only forgive our sins, but he chooses not to remember them. In our earthly brains, it's hard to understand. In our earthly brains, it's hard to understand You know that creation was started in the beginning. In our earthly brains, it's hard to understand that Noah put two of every species on a boat. In our earthly brains, it's maybe difficult to understand that one man was born by the Virgin Mary from God that saved us all. But that's what it was. It was Jesus Christ that was brought to this earth to save us he is the only way. He's the truth, the light, and the way. And for me, that's enough. That's enough for me to believe everything in this Bible, everything in this book. 
So it was difficult to try to figure out what, what was I going to share with you today. Knowing that the kids were doing a great service, I could give you a message on kids and children and raising up our kids right. And maybe you guys would probably like to tickle your ears a little bit about that, but it's about the true word of God. So this morning, that's why we chose Jude, again, because it's a book that not very many even realize it's in the Bible. Um, it's short. I like short. <laughs> I know that um, with the children's service as well, that uh, my time might have been limited. Um, when we go to raise these children, let's rem please remember the Word of God. Remember everything that's inside here. We see them up here. They're the ones that are going after us to hold these services. They're the ones that are going to be up here delivering the message. They're the ones that are going to be going out into the community trying to help others with their salvation. This afternoon, um, the Life Chain, if you look in your bulletins, uptown, we have the Life Chain event from 2 to 3. If you're available, please come up to the CVS, uh, the parking lot right across from CVS at 145. Um, the Life Chain is a peaceful, prayerful public witness to pro-life, so um, they'll have a bunch of different signs there you can choose from. It's a silent, um, uh, peaceful demonstration. You just stand along the side of the road. Don't yell and chant. And What I ask is for you to pray at that moment in time. Um, it's not like you guys are watching football today anyway, right? <laughs> the life chain is to support the children that weren't able to be here. The life chain is to support the decisions that our society has said is okay. We know it's not okay. Just be there to support it if you're available. Um, don't forget to look in here for other uh, news events here. When we went through that list of eight things, one of those was fellowship with God and other believers and ministry to others. On the back of your bulletin, you also see the list of ministry leaders and different ministries that are available here at the church. If there's something that interests you there, feel free to give that person or individual a call about something that, that may be on your heart. If, if you have an idea in your head to help others that may not be on this list. Have a talk with Pastor Kenny, where I can give you a hand. Um, and we'll see how it matches up with our mission statement of the church, and that's to make disciples. Um, again, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us this morning. We thank you for the children and the children leaders that led the service, and though they made it difficult to follow up against, um, I thank you for the opportunity to stand up here and to share your word and to proclaim your truth. And I pray that if there's anybody here that may be in doubt or uh, may be hurting right now, may uh, be in need of prayer, that they, they come up and seek you and as we look at your word of Jude, we, we see that even thousands of years ago, the church was seeing the same problems, that um, people had their own agenda. Um, we pray that you keep our motives pure here at Solid Rock Chapel. And we thank you for the leadership that you've given us here at Solid Rock Chapel. We just pray that each and every person here this morning follows that list, to stay in your word, to pray, to fellowship with you, to have hope, minister to others, evangelize, be separate from sin, and realize that it begins and ends with an assurance of salvation from you. Thank you for sending your son to die on that cross for us. There's nothing we can do to ever, to ever 
pay you back for that other than be your servant. Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.